we're going to talk about diet in a little bit, but I want to, I want to talk about the widespread nutritional deficiencies that you're seeing and, and how those play a role in the brain and cognitive decline and what are the most important nutrients we need to be focusing on. Yeah, you know, it's amazing to me because we've got so many things working against us. And obviously, you've written probably more on this than anyone, looking at the critical nature of nutrients for your health, you know, looking at all, you know, changing the world one bite at a time and all these fantastic things that you've done. And this fits, again, it's, it just fits perfectly with the science that we've studied over the years. And mm. so, you know, Paul Clayton from Oxford has pointed out that we don't even have the nutrients in the soils that people had 100 years ago, 200 years ago, when we were thinking, you know, these people, wow, they didn't know what they were doing. They were doing much better than we are because mm -hmm. they actually, he's pointing out that, you know, Henry VIII had better nutrition than we do. Uh, of course, he ended up being obese and had problems with arthritis and things. But the key is that they actually had better soil. So we've got a, essentially a triple whammy. Number one, we have poor soils and therefore we have poor overall nutrition. Number two, we're eating food that's way too high in sugar, obviously, and way too high in processed foods, I mean, all these issues. So we're eating stuff that's, that's toxic. Um, and then number three, we're, n we're not getting enough, nearly enough fiber, nearly enough phytonutrients. So we have this system. It's as if you took your car out and you're, you're trying to drive this car that needs appropriate fuel and you're putting stuff in that is very low octane. It's just mm. sputtering. It's spluttering. It's having trouble getting out of the block. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, you might go a little way. You might, and that's what we're all dealing with every day. So if you crappy see fuel. Optimum, <laughs> crappy fuel. You optimize those things. You get people into some ketosis. You get them appropriate fiber for, for detox and for their microbiome. You get them appropriate low carb diet. You, do, you get the appropriate uh, phytonutrients. And by the way, one of the most common deficiencies, choline. As you know, mm. Choline is needed to make acetylcholine, yeah. which is a critical neurotransmitter for memory and yeah. is reduced in people with Alzheimer's. And uh, I've checked myself on the chronometer and I realize I'm not getting enough choline in my diet. You know, we should be getting around 550 milligrams or so of choline each day. Which Most you get of from us where? Aren't. Eggs and You get sardines. it from eggs and from, yes, from sardines, from liver, obviously, you know, organ meats, things like that, uh, from oysters, things like that, a number of vegetables as well. Um, or you can, if you're not getting it from there, take some citicoline. This is why Professor Wortman from MIT found that citicoline is so helpful for synapse formation. Yeah. So you know, lots of ways to get choline, but please make sure that you get enough. So all of these things are critical. So what besides choline is so important for the brain? Oh, Nutri uh, well. Nutrient. Uh, what nutrients? Take I'll take flavanols, flavanols and flavonoids, those alone, a uh, study that just came out showing that over thousands of people, those who were in the highest quartile of flavanols had a much lower dementia risk than those who were in the lowest quartile of flavanols. So things like you know, strawberries and things like grapes and things like that, all, all helpful to give you the flavanols and then the flavonoids, things like blueberries and things like that, all yeah. critical. So those are like 25,000 different phytochemicals in plants. Exactly. And, yep. and flavanols and flavonoids are part of those. And so yep. eating a rainbow colored diet where half your plate is vegetables is a simple take home to protect your brain and pretty much everything else that could go wrong with you. <laughs> uh, so we've got choline, we've got flavonoids and phytonutrients. What other major nutrients are an issue? Well, you know, the minerals, so the, the key ones that m almost all of us are deficient, as you know, in zinc, um, and zinc has become a huge issue because of COVID-19. So many mm. of the people who are deficient in zinc are reduced and have an increased poor outcome, increased risk for having a poor outcome from COVID-19. So zinc, magnesium, iodine, potassium. Those are the big four that most of us are deficient in. And then, of course, vitamin D. As you know, the study that just came out about 10 days ago showing yeah. if you take the people who are low in vitamin D, they have a much worse outcome in COVID-19 yeah. than the people who have sufficient vitamin D. And of course, Alzheimer's is no different. The same thing you see. People who are low in vitamin D, more likely to get Alzheimer's. People who are sufficient vitamin D. And of course, same thing in multiple sclerosis. High vitamin D associated with better outcomes. Outcomes. So, as you said, it's multiple diseases that all depend on these critical factors. 
Some of the most important things I found are B vitamins. I once had a patient yep. who was about yep. 80 something years old. She was on multiple boards, very successful woman, but was noticing depression and really severe cognitive decline. Had been diagnosed yep. with MCI or pre-dementia, told to get her affairs in order. She came to see me and I'm like, checked her levels uh, and found she had a really high level of something called methylmalonic acid and homocysteine, right. which right. are things that most doctors don't check, but reflect your status of B12, which right. is methylmalonic acid and homocysteine, which is the folate and even B6. So I basically gave her B12 shots, high doses of methylfolate, which is a particular kind. Saw she had some genes that made her need a special kind of folate. And she called me back and was doing amazing and all of her symptoms had gone away. Yeah. Yeah. And then a few years later, maybe four or five years later, she called me up and I thought, oh, I saw her in my schedule. I'm like, maybe she's not doing well. Or she's declining. I kind of worry about her a little bit. And, and she's like, Dr. Hyman, you know, I'm going trekking in Bhutan and I want to know what I should do to prepare and what I should be taking with me. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And I think, you know, sometimes it's that simple, but it's not always that simple. But I think understanding the role of nutrients and nutritional deficiencies is huge. Uh, it's far more common than we think. You can't get everything you need from food. I think a lot of the reason the studies on vitamins have failed in large trials, whether it's for cancer or heart disease, is because they're not dealing with the, the, the whole system. They're just right. like, if you're eating, you know, donuts all day, you can take all the fish oil or vitamin D you want. It's not going to do anything to fix your risk of heart disease, right? So you have to look at everything together. So, Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about uh, this, this concept you talked about called keto flex. We've touched on it a number of times, right. but what is the diet that's best for your brain? And what is the diet that's best for your brain if you actually have Alzheimer's? Yeah, great point. So let me preface this by saying I know far less about nutrition than you do. So, you know, I'm really I'm talking to someone who's an expert here. I, I'm looking at the neurochemistry. So I'm interested in, you know, synapses, how they're made, how do you keep them? And so this is Ketoflex 12.3 is nothing more than what's the thing we can use to drive your biochemistry toward an optimal biochemistry for making and keeping synapses. And so mm. what do you need? You need to have ketosis. You need to have all the nutrients we were just talking about for support. You need to have high fiber because you need to help yourself detox. You need to improve your microbiome, all those sorts of things. You need to have appropriate probiotics to support your microbiome. And you need to have fasting periods for autophagy, fasting periods for helping you to get into ketosis, fasting periods for all the great things that fasting does, even in things like lowering your blood pressure. Hypertension is another big risk factor for Alzheimer's. So if you put all that biochemistry together and you mix it up, you know, mix it up in a blender and you say, what's the diet? It, we named it Ketoflex 12.3. It's ketotic. It's mildly ketotic. It's plant-rich. This is not a bacon-related uh, keto, you know, ketotic diet, ketogenic diet. This is a plant-rich, high good fats, intermediate proteins, low carb, and no simple carbs. It is flexitarian, and I realize flexitarian means you have to eat some meat and fish. It's really more about flexibility. You want to be a vegetarian? No problem. Make sure to check your homocysteine and your vitamin D and things like that, but fine. If you want to have some meat, you know, have some fish. It's hard to be, I think, keto if you're not eating animal protein. I mean, you can do it as a vegan or vegetarian, but it's, it's harder because you it's harder. It's hard to eat, reduce the carbohydrate load because you need the protein from beans and grains and things like that. So how do you do that with those patients? Yeah, that's a great point. And so, you know, again, because getting into ketosis is so critical for supporting brain energetics, we tell them just start by taking some exogenous ketones. Do it for a couple of months, no problem, because we need to get that energy up. After so taking that, it as a supplement. Then, Exactly. Then you can get yourself into endogenous ketosis. And we do that by increasing the fat consumption and you know, all the appropriate oils and the nuts and the seeds and all the things that you've written about that are mm. excellent sources of good dietary fats. And then again, and then if they can't get into ke enough ketosis, okay, we can supplement that a little bit to get them where they need to be. So it's then, so that's the flex part. And then 12-3 is 12 hours as a minimum. And if you're APOE4 positive, you should really make it 14 to 16 hours of a fast between when you finish your dinner, when you start your breakfast, brunch, or lunch. And then the three is for three hours before go, you go to bed. You don't want to be eating right before bed because it'll spike your insulin, reduce your, you know, your growth hormone in your, in your melatonin and so forth and so on. So this is why Ketoflex 12.3 is essentially our attempt to take the neurochemistry of synaptogenesis and to put it into a diet.
That's so incredible. So you're saying you don't have to be keto if you're not having Alzheimer's for prevention. This is more for, for treating a patient, right? It's a great point, and this is one of the things that we've been arguing about lately. Um, if you're just there for prevention, do you want to get yourself into ketosis? It depends on how concerned you are. If you are really concerned about prevention, then you probably want to do get at least part-time, getting yourself into some mild ketosis. But you're mm -hmm. right. You don't have to. For someone who's trying to reverse, absolutely. It doesn't reverse well if you don't get into ketosis because mm -hmm. you're missing yeah. that en energy gap. And I, Yeah. I've seen I've seen that with my patients uh, when I when I put them on ketosis if they're struggling because often people will get better without it but you know yes. just on a low glycemic diet but then you really want to push that envelope they they seem to do a lot better um, and what about ApoE4 because this is a common yeah. gene that increases your risk and you have one or two copies um, and there may be some interesting data that I'd love to explore with you because historically there was concern that these patients should not eat saturated fat, that they may have more problems with cardiovascular disease and dementia. Right. What is the current status of the data on these ApoE4 patients, um, which are a lot? I mean, they're, what, about 45 million or something in America? Yes, 75, 75 million. million. 75 yes, 75 million. Was so here's the thing. Three quarters of the population is ApoE4 negative, uh, and one quarter of the population is ApoE4 positive. So it's incredibly common, and there are some advantages you have to, have it, to being ApoE4 positive. And so uh, in third world countries, uh, it actually gives you a big advantage because you have a more pro-inflammatory state. You're better at fighting off pathogens and you're actually better if you have a starvation diet. If you're starving, you want to be ApoE4 positive because you are better fat absorber. So mm -hmm. 75 million Americans have one copy and they are at 30% lifetime risk for Alzheimer's. If you're negative, mm -hmm. about 9% lifetime risk. Mm -hmm. One copy, 30%, two copies, well over 50%. Most likely you will develop Alzheimer's and that's mm -hmm. 7 million Americans. So critical for all of these people to be on prevention. Absolutely. And as far as the fats, it's a good point, and this is a controversial area still. Some arguments would say, yes, a limited amount of saturated fats, okay. I think most people who are ApoE4 positive would like to stick with the monounsaturates and polyunsaturates and stay away. So typically, we don't recommend, for example, coconut oil, MCT oil. We recommend if you want to take some, want to get into ketosis exogenously, just take some exogenous ketone. Take ketone salts, take ketone esters, those sorts of things. You can do that a couple of times a day and get nice spikes in your ketone level. And then ultimately, again, you want to get into it endogenously. So, you know, if I had to, to say one way or the other today, I would say the preponderance of the evidence today is on the notion that you would want to stay away from saturated fats. Having said that, there are people who do have some saturated fats in their diet and have beautiful lipid profiles, despite the fact that they are ApoE4 positive. So you want to check your blood work and see how you're responding to your diet, not just guess, sure. right? Absolutely. Check your LDL yeah. particle number. Try to keep that between 800 and 1200. Uh, or if you want, check your calcium score to make sure that you don't have any cardiovascular disease. Of course, there's an increased risk for cardiovascular disease as well with people who are ApoE4 positive. So as you said, check to see where you stand to make sure you're doing well. Now, a lot, a lot of people listening, and mm -hmm. if there are medical professionals listening, they probably think it's heresy to say that we can reverse Alzheimer's, that it's providing false hope that we don't have the science behind it, uh, and it's really not possible. Uh, but you and I have both seen that it is possible, uh, yeah. and it, it's not always 100%. But sure. the question is, you know, really to what degree, in your experience, is this, is this reversible? And, and, and how far along um, can you be before you can, you know, be confident that it's going to be reversed? In other words, is there a time when it's too late? Um, right. So can you talk about what that is, maybe a case or two that explains, you know, really how this works in, in practice. Absolutely. So we can think of this in four phases. Phase one is where people are asymptomatic, but they already have the pathophysiology ongoing. And those people are the ones for, for prevention and they do very well. And let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a person who came to you for Alzheimer's prevention who then developed Alzheimer's while on your program? Um, I think I've had people, you know, progress slowly over 10 years, you know, okay. like I've had people kept them good for 10 years. And then, mm -hmm. and then sometimes they, if they slip off the program, yeah. that's when they get into trouble. Well, 
exactly slipping off the program. So I, I ask this to, to you know many functional doctors. T typically, very few people have seen this. When you're on prevention and you start when you're asymptomatic, you do very well. Then the next phase is SCI, subjective cognitive impairment, which actually lasts about 10 years, where you know there's something wrong, often your spouse does, but you're still scoring well on the testing. Those people, virtually all of them get better because it's these are still early stages. Then the next stage is mild cognitive impairment. And these are people who are scoring 23, 24, 25 on the MOCA scores or 26. This is Montreal Cognitive Assessment Scores out of Memory 30. Test, right. Yeah. So they clearly have significant early Alzheimer's, but we call it mild cognitive impairment at that point. And the majority of those people will increase uh, their scores. And we wrote a paper on this with 100 documented improvements and published it in 2018 with 15 different laboratories. And the average improvement in score was 4.9. So if you came in at 22, you ended up around 27 typically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's clearly improving and they typically sustain it. Then the ones who then are all the way to Alzheimer's, they're now losing activities of daily living. You know, calling someone Alzheimer's is like saying late stage cancer, metastatic cancer, because it's a very late stage of this process that's been going on typically for 20 years. Some of those people improve, and, and we've had people with MOCA scores of zero improve, but when they improve, they go from zero to five. You know, they'll, they dress themselves again, they speak again, they interact with their families again, they can even do emails again, but they're not normal. So we're not, so far, not able to take someone from zero to 30. And that's one of the big research questions right now. What is missing? They come to a next plateau. What do we need to get them to a higher mm. plateau? Mm. Is there a rate limiting step that's preventing or is it just the massive loss of synapses? Do we need to then think about stem cells, intranasal trophic factors, yeah. you know, methylene blue, all these sorts of things that are coming. EWOT, that's another thing we've been interested in. Exercise with oxygen therapy. All the things that we can bring to bear. So the bottom line is the farther along, the harder it is, and the less complete the improvement. But hmm. if you catch people early or even in mid-stage, you can do a lot, just as you've indicated. Absolutely. I've seen that. So can you share maybe a story or two yeah. of a patient you treated, what you found, and what kind of things you did, and how they improved? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, there are, and there are hundreds and hundreds like this. Uh, so, you know, simple example uh, of, uh, of a woman, uh, an amazing lady uh, who's a psychiatrist uh, who was having major problems. Uh, and in fact, her husband uh, said to her uh, that, uh, you know, he said, your memory is disastrous. She, she got to the point where she just couldn't remember anything. She's 73 years old. Uh, and actually, she contacted me by email a few years ago. And we started going back and forth. And she started checking all the various things and she had initially had a lot of the type 2 reduced estradiol progesterone no surprise she was 73 reduced vitamin D poor thyroid all those so all those were addressed um, she then improved and she actually went from nine so she was in the ninth percentile on her initial cognitive scores she's now at the 97th percentile wow. on her cognitive score so she just just dramatic she got very as you as you've seen yourself people get into this and she started doing this game called elevate as well as brain HQ these are brain training programs and she just got into this stuff and started working it she started dealing with all like these brain things. exercises brain exercises and then interestingly she you know she optimized her various nutrients and then it turned out said wait a minute you know we haven't checked all the pathogens here she ended up having ehrlichia she was from the, the she was from the New York area mm. and so and she ended up having exposure because of a tick bite uh, yeah. when that was treated she continued to improve and she's just done well now she interestingly she had not only improvement in her MRI hippocampal volume she also had a PET scan her first PET scan was diagnosed as looks like early Alzheimer's. Her latest PET scan looks like no Alzheimer's. Wow. So she actually improved her PET scan, improved her MRI, improved her cognitive scores. And as she said, you know, she, her, her uh, significant other said to her, you know, you went from disastrous to just plain lousy and then from just plain lousy to normal. And so she now plays, she goes out and plays golf with her friends and they Incredible. can't cheat it. They can't cheat her anymore. She knows how many strokes they've taken. Incredible. And, and what did her neurologist say? 
Yeah, you know, interestingly, her neurologist said, he, in fact, she went in, she, st- she said to me, that she went in there and there were all these people. He, she said it was a very depressing, kind of typical neurologist's office. Everything's bad. And she said he came out and he was so excited because he saw how much better she was doing. And he started saying to her, you know, what have you been doing? This is, a, this is incredible. And we hear this a lot. People will come out and say, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because something is working here. Well, they, 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 this is really exciting. What, what is on the horizon in terms of the research you're doing? Because you know, clearly you and I have had experiences. We're seeing this over yeah. and over. Our colleagues who are doing this in functional medicine are seeing these results. But yeah. it's still pretty much dismissed by most traditional neurologists and Alzheimer's yeah. researchers. And even you know, all the Alzheimer's funding isn't going toward this. So Absolutely. What, what is on the horizon that, that gives you hope around the research that we can show the data and, and begin to change the conversation? You know, this is a great point because we really do have the opportunity now to reduce the global burden of dementia dramatically. And, you know, people wiped out things like polio and smallpox with vaccines, global programs. We need to have a global program to reduce the burden of dementia around the world by doing these correct things. And, you know, it's, this is not magic. This is our complex organism that we're dealing with. And you have to look at the right things and do the right things to do that. Where the research is going is to take these same principles. What we're finding, of course, is that the supply is being exceeded by the demand in all of these diseases. So we have to increase the supply, reduce the demand. And there's a, there's a unique chemistry for each of these, for macular diseases degeneration, for frontotemporal dementia, for ALS, for Lewy body disease, and on and on. And adjusting this sort of approach to each of these, we should be able for the first time to make improvements in all of these different Mm, neurodegenerative mm. diseases. When you get to the core of Alzheimer's, it is fundamentally a network insufficiency. In other words, just as you would have scurvy if you didn't have enough vitamin C, if you don't have enough support for this neuroplasticity network, and that includes dozens and dozens of different things from hormones to trophic factors to nutrients to oxygenation to mitochondrial function, as you know, it is kind of a perfect disease for functional medicine. Yeah. Because when you look at it, there are all these things that contribute. And so unfortunately, all the scientists have been going after, let's get that one molecular species Let's get the misfolded protein. No, let's get the amyloid. Let's get the tau. Let's get the prions. Let's get the herpes, whatever. It's all reductionist. It's It's all reductionist. Exactly. And so you really have to look at this as a systems biology disorder and treat it with functional medicine. And when you go after all those things, you not only see people prevent the decline, but they also absolutely reverse the decline. Now, it's harder and harder the longer and longer you wait, of course. But we see tremendous reversals. As you know, we have a a preprint on a trial where 84% of people actually improve their scores, which is unprecedented. And now we've just published another follow-up on 225 people who also improve their scores uh, and improve their metabolic status as well. So we're very excited about this approach. So I just want to just gloss over what you just said, because you said that 84% of people in this trial that you did improve their cognitive scores absolutely that's that's incredible because that just isn't possible given our current approach and so you know to me this is something that should have billions of dollars of nih funding to look at uh, as opposed to all the ways we have been looking at it which is looking at the reductionist approach of looking for the single drug to affect a single pathway this is a multi-system disorder and and the beautiful part about your work deal is you've really gone into the details of all the things that affect the brain so, so the brain is, as we learned, you know, I, 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 we went to medical school, we learned that, you know, basically there's this blood brain barrier and there's this, basically it's an isolated system above the neck, which is just nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that everything that affects the body affects the brain, everything yeah. that, and, and, then, and vice versa, but also we have to really understand how do we leverage those things. And in your, in your work, you talk about, you know, three key major things that are causing uh, problems that may need to be addressed. One is is insulin resistance, one is inflammation, and one is lack of what we call trophic factors, which are things that help the brain grow and work. Yeah. So can you talk about sort of from a big picture perspective, then we'll get into the details of actually what is causing these three things, because these three things are driving all these other pathways. And right. there are many, many ways to get problems with insulin resistance or inflammation 
or lack of trophic factors. But can you just talk about these three things in, in, in general and how they affect the brain? It's a great point. And, and really, we have to flip, completely flip the way we think about this disease. Because as you know, it has been thought about as why did you make this bad amyloid? The amyloid is bad for your brain. We just have to get rid of it. And that's not the way this disease works. As I mentioned, it's an insufficiency. So what's happening is your brain is under attack, just as you indicated. This is a systems problem. This is a whole body problem. And it is under attack, as you mentioned, inflammation, any, any sorts of pathogens or leaky gut or chronic sinusitis or poor dentition, any of those things will give you this ongoing inflammatory process. And anything that does that will make your body respond by creating amyloid because the amyloid is actually an antimicrobial agent. So you are literally responding to these insults by making this stuff that is great for killing the bacteria, the spirochetes, the fungi, the viruses, but mm. also is damaging your mitochondria just yeah. as we hear from a number of antibiotics. So what's happening now is your brain literally switches to a downsizing protective mode. Your brain is going from a mode of functioning, making synapses, keeping synapses to, uh-oh, I'm under attack. I'm going to go into a protective downsizing mode, just as the world did with COVID-19. <laughs> went into a downsizing mode, protective mode, same idea. And as you indicated, it's really four big areas. So it's it's anything with inflammation, toxins. So as you have talked about many times, these toxins, whether they be inorganics, organics, or biotoxins are absolutely crucial for that downsizing. Your brain responds by downsizing once again. The third area is energetics, and that's oxygenation, blood flow, mitochondria, and ketones, the ability to have a substrate to burn. And then the fourth area, as you indicated, trophic factors, things like insulin resistance, critical, uh, loss of estradiol, loss of testosterone, loss of nutrients like vitamin D, uh, loss of NGF or BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. These are all critical for keeping your brain functioning optimally. And so you can literally write an equation and see where the brain is for each of these people when they are having cognitive decline. Yeah, it's so it's so important because the 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 things that you looked at were so different than a traditional neurologist, right? I mean, in the study that you just um, preliminary published called "Precision Medicine Approach to Alzheimer's: Successful Proof of Concept Trial." This is a preprint publication; it should be published and peer reviewed. It's not yet, but it but it was very interesting to read about the the design of the study, the things that you looked at, and how you address them, which is quite different than traditional medicine, right? And I'd love to sort of go through some of, some of the details about how we start to look at these things. Because there wasn't one thing, you know, you look at genetics, you look at biochemical markers, you look at MRI and brain imaging, you look at infections, you look at all so many different things. So can you kind of walk us through? Because I think what, what people need to understand is that if, if you just do one thing, it's not necessarily right. going to work. You have to look at all the factors. And you always say, you know, if your roof has 36 holes in it, right. if you patch three of them, it's still going to rain inside your house. So you got to deal with all the holes. And essentially, exactly. that's the approach. And it's, people go, well, how do you know it works? How do you know it's working? Is it this or that? In a way, you, you need everything. If you want to grow a plant, you can't just have sunlight but no soil or water. Or you can't just have water but no sunlight and soil. Like You need all. <laughs> and so I think that's a, a, dis, a disruptive idea in traditional medicine, which is we have to use multi-system approaches for a multiple uh, factors that are being addressed at the same time. So can you kind of walk us through the kinds of things we look at on the yeah, and of course, you have been pioneering this for many years. Uh, you and Jeffrey Bland and others have been pioneering this approach where you say, okay, uh, we're literally, I mean, it's interesting to me, this is an inflection point in the history of medicine. Up mm -hmm. until when you guys got going with functional medicine, everything was about, okay, we're going to find that one thing. We're going to write a prescription. We're going to find that one thing, and hopefully things will be a little better. And that works great for pneumococcal pneumonia. But now for these complex chronic illnesses and neurodegenerative illnesses are probably the best example, but of course, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, so many others. Now, instead of just finding that one thing, you have to go from the other direction. Ask what are all the things that are failing in that network, in that system. Yeah. And of course, what's interesting is this turns again, completely backward the way we do these trials. All previous trials, 
you decide ahead. I mean, isn't this crazy? You decide ahead of time what you're going to do to treat it. When someone comes in with cognitive decline, we're going to give them drug X. Well, we don't want to decide ahead of time. We want to look to see why did they have cognitive decline. And then we want to go after those things. So as you indicated, yes, we look at their genetics. We look, for example, are they ABLE4 positive or negative? There's a whole other set. There are dozens and dozens of genes that play on this. But as you've indicated before, these are not your fate. They simply increase your risk. Yeah. So we look at that and then we look at their hormonal status, their nutritional status, their gut status. We look at their status of all, all the inflammagens. We look at their, at their um, oral microbiome. We look to mm. see whether they have chronic sinusitis. Do, mm. you know, do they have a leaky gut? What is their gut microbiome status? All of these different players. And then, of course, we look at, do they have mycotoxin exposure? Do they have organic mold? Toxins? That's from mold, right? Yeah. Molds and, and mold-related toxins. And, of course, you know, many people have been exposed to air pollution. That's another big one now that we currently has been shown to increase risk for cognitive decline. So we look at all of these different features. The good news is we know from the research what is that set of things that tend to cause cognitive decline. It's not an infinite set. It's a set of dozens and dozens of things. And so we want to look at all of those things. And the diagnosis, if it's Alzheimer's or if it's Parkinson's or something else, tells you here are the things that are likely to be causing those. So, for example, in Parkinson's, it's more likely to be organic toxins like TCE. But in Alzheimer's, it's more likely to be things like mycotoxins or reduced vitamin D or reduced uh, hormonal support or NGF or BDNF, things like that. So then we address those things with a functional medicine sort of approach. And the results are unprecedented, as we indicated, probably most important in the paper. Not only did their cognitive scores clearly improve, but their MRIs actually improved. And there's a long history of following MRIs in patients with cognitive decline. On average, if you have cognitive decline, your gray matter volume shrinks each year by about 4.5%. If you are a normal person and you're actually doing quite well, you still have a slight shrinkage, about 1.7%. These people mm. actually, their gray matter volume actually went up. It actually wow. went higher instead of going down. So they did even better, even though they had Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, they actually did better than a normal person at that age. Wait, wait. wait. So what you're saying is in general, everybody's brain declines. Alzheimer's declines like, more. Yep. And the average person declines a little bit. What you're saying is people with already damaged brains not only didn't decline, but they got better, that they okay. improved the size and function of their brain. Absolutely. That's exactly that's, what that's we reported a, in that paper. That's like discovering penicillin, right? I mean, this is like a big deal. And, and yet, and you and I both know there's a long way to go still. Um, you know, we've had a few people with cognitive scores, mochas of zero improved, but the, but the majority of the people at the end stage don't. So we need to understand, continue to develop this to understand what do we do with the people who are farther along? How do we make it so that every single person gets better? Now, one other good thing that came out of this paper, 84% of the people improved, but the 16% who got worse we actually looked at, okay, why? And you could why? see in some of these people. So there was an example, one woman who said who had high mycotoxins in her home, in her urine. We mm -hmm. said, okay, you got to get out of there. You got to remediate this. She said, I'm not leaving my house. I'm not remediating it. And of course, part of the problem was that sure. part of this was carried out during the pandemic. And yes. so when we started it, the pandemic hadn't started yet. But as we were going through the trial, the pandemic hit and people didn't want to go out and they didn't want to do some of the things that they would normally do. So they unfortunately had increased exposure to, to mycotoxins. So no surprise, she did not get better. Wow. So basically what you do with these patients is you do a personalized approach, yes. which is looking at all the variables that we talked about. Just to kind of recap a little bit, you, you really look at uh, specific genetics around the ApoE4, which is really the, the with the Alzheimer's gene, but it doesn't predis doesn't make sure you're going to get it. it just predisposes you to it. Right. You look at factors around detoxification and how we get rid of toxins. You look at methylation, which is about B vitamins, and then you also look at the whole insulin resistance package, right? Because a lot of times doctors don't look at insulin; they just measure your cholesterol or your blood sugar, your A1C, but that's not enough. There's ways to really look deeply at 
what's going on there. We look at uh, cardiovascular risk, inflammation, CRP, homocysteine. You look at all the other factors around infections like herpes and Epstein-Barr, tick infections. Uh, you look at the gut, see what's going on in there. Is there imbalances in the flora? All the hormones you mentioned, uh, estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone, DHA, testosterone, all these hormones are really important, thyroid. Uh, yes. You look at all your nutritional status, right? The B vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin E, magnesium, zinc, copper, CoQ10, lipoic acid, omega 3s. You look at all the toxins, metals, organic pollutants like uh, pesticides, biotoxins, mold toxins you mentioned, and all the autoimmune markers and immune function and sleep studies and all these things that look at how you actually see what's going on. So you're basically taking a soil sample of everything going on in the body that may affect the brain. And then you see what's out of balance and then you tune it up. So you're really not treating the Alzheimer's. You're just helping people get healthy and clearing out all the stuff that's bad for them and putting in the stuff that's good for them. Absolutely. We're looking at all the things that are driving this. And Mark, I think it's really critical for people to understand. Doctors have been trying to treat Alzheimer's after it's been there for 20 years. So there are four stages. If we could get to everybody in the first two instead of the, the fourth one, and then by the way, this in this trial, we did people in the third and early fourth stages. So they were still very far along. But the reality is you go through a period where you are asymptomatic, but you already yeah. have abnormal spinal fluid and abnormal PET scans. Then you go through what's called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment, which lasts about 10 years. So we have a tremendous window. And those people, 100% of them reverse and do beautifully. But rarely mm. do people come in during that time because it's relative, you know, they know there's something wrong. Their spouses often notice, but they say, well, I'm not that bad yet. I'll wait. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Wait. don't wait. Then the third thing is called mild cognitive impairment. It should be called relatively advanced Alzheimer's disease. It's the third of four stages. And if people would simply recognize that, not wait till then, everyone could do better. And then it's the fourth and final stage that we actually call Alzheimer's disease. So again, my, you know, calling something mild cognitive impairment is like saying you have mildly metastatic cancer. It's a late stage of the problem, and we'd, right. we'd like to get to people earlier and earlier. So as you indicated, we look at all these different things. And what we're saying really is that, yes, that's what Alzheimer's is. It is yeah. your brain's attempt to deal with these ongoing insults by producing a substance, amyloid, and the other downstream uh, molecules like phosphotal that actually fights the insults, that it fights the infections, you know, things coming, the oral microbiome, things like P. gingivalis, the neuropathologists find in the brains of patients wow. with Alzheimer's wow. disease. Various mold and, and, and fungal species they find in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Herpes simplex, of course, from the lip, we find in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a recurrent situation with these various pathogens and with the brain's response to these pathogens. Yeah. So you're basically taking all this understanding of the things that do affect the brain, right. and then you, then you create a therapeutic plan that addresses it on an individual level. And I remember this article years ago called Shifting Thinking in Dementia in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And there was this great line in there where the author said, you know, there, there's basically categorical uh, misclassification and etiologic imprecision. And that means that we categorize people according to symptoms, you lost your memory, right. not according to the etiology or cause. So this flips it upside down and is focused on medicine by cause, not by symptom. And, and that's, that's what you're doing. So everybody doesn't get the same plan. They get, if, you know, if someone has mold, they get that treated. If someone has diabetes, they get that treated. If someone has a toxin, they get that treated. If they're, someone's nutritionally deficient in this particular nutrient or that, that gets treated. So it's very individualized. Right. So you're, you're not just kind of throwing the same treatment at everybody. So tell us about a high level. There, there's the foundational pieces, and then there's the more therapeutic pieces. So there's diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management, and, and brain training, which are the sort of foundation. Talk about Talk about what are the specific kinds of dietary strategies, exercise strategies, and the sleep strategies uh, that you're using to help these patients? Because yeah. there's some really foundational research on how these things affect the brain, and of course, stress, and then brain exercise or brainer size, <laughs> which yeah. is uh, brain training. 
Yeah, it's a great point. And so, as you know, uh, you know, when we were in the lab, this is way back in 2007, this guy named Mark Hyman wrote a book about, hey, you should be treating these brain diseases with these multifactorial approaches. And the interesting thing to me uh, is, I wouldn't listen to anything that guy says, by the way. Yeah. I just, <laughs> so the interesting thing to me is what we found in the test tube over 30 years fits beautifully with what you published back in 2007. And so what we're yeah. seeing is very much the same thing. And as yeah. you indicated, the, the great news here is, Whereas we've always been told there's absolutely nothing you can do to prevent, reverse, or delay cognitive decline, and we hear this again and again and again. In fact, the arsenal is huge. We have a huge armamentarium. And yes, it's diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, supplementation, and detoxification as the beginning. And then beyond that, there may be other things that, that are dependent on what we find. But those are the basics. And as you indicated, you start with nutrition that probably of all the things is the most important in terms of getting a good output. So if you're if, if getting a good outcome. So if you look at, again, we're kind of coming this from the biochemical side. If you look at what is the biochemistry that it takes to make you start making synapses again and reforming those and start making your synapses work again, there are several features to it. So number one, you have to get the appropriate energy delivery. And so what happens is, you know, you have both the ability to burn ketones, the ability to burn glucose. Well, when you have cognitive decline, you've lost both of those. So you are literally starving your brain. You've mm. lost the glucose because you now have insulin resistance. You've lost the ketones because your insulin is high and it's preventing yeah. you from making the ketones. Yeah. So you need to get those both back. You need to become keto adapted and you need to get into ketosis, but you need to become metabolically flexible and be able to go back and forth between burning. So getting people to do that is a critical piece of this. And then, it's a, you know, it's a plant rich, you know, uh, low carb, they have essentially zero simple carbs, uh, keep mild no sugar and starch, ketogenic. no sugar. Exactly. Starch. Mildly ketogenic diet. And we encourage people to measure their ketones, whether you like to do it by finger stick or you can do it by breathalyzer to get in the appropriate ketone range, have appropriate time for autophagy um, and for your glymphatics to act. In other words, appropriate time for sleep, appropriate time. Yeah. So, so we so want to talk about autophagy and the fasting because that's really important too, right? Yeah, critical. So autophagy, you're basically recycling components of your brain that are damaged, including things like mitochondria that aren't working so well. In fact, there was a beautiful experiment a few years ago in which just preventing the autophagy of mitochondria, that alone led to Parkinson's. And this is in animal models, of course, but it shows how critical it is to get rid of wow. the old batteries and make the new wow. batteries. And so this is a critical piece. And so, yes, we want to get people to have autophagy, which we do 12 to 16 hours of fasting at night. If you're APOE4 positive, we'd like to see it more 14 to 16. If you're APOE4 negative, 12 to 14 is probably good yeah. enough. And then you can, again, measure your ketones. Uh, and then it should be, as I say, plant rich. You've got to have the phytonutrients, but you've also uh, got to have it so that you have a high fiber diet. It turns out this is critical. This improves your, your glucose loads, as you know. It imp improves glycotoxicity. It improves your lipid status. It improves your gut microbiome. It helps with detox. So surprisingly, high fiber diets important for a number of reasons yeah. um, and, and you know, really critical. Um, so that's the combination. We call this KetoFlex 12-3, but you can do it any way you like, as long as the, the bottom line is you improve those parameters. That gets yeah. you the best outcome in, you know, in this in, in cognitive decline, restoring that insulin sensitivity, restoring the metabolic flexibility, getting the phytonutrients, helping with the detox, optimizing your gut microbiome. And as you know, lots of studies showing relationship between gut microbiome and brain function. Tell us about, you know, how you came to understand that what you learned as a neurologist and as a researcher around Alzheimer's co corresponded with these emerging ideas around functional medicine and how that led to you to develop the Bredesen Protocol. Yeah, you know, and thank goodness there was functional medicine or we would still be, you know, figuring out how do we put all this together. So, you know, we were interested for 30 years in the laboratory and we we're simply going and as you said, 
People have been unable to treat these diseases. Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, neurodegenerative disease has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. So we were trying to study what are the molecular drivers of this process. And what we could see with research was that there is a central switch, APP, which is literally integrating over all these signals. So the big surprise was that Everybody who was talking about Alzheimer's had the wrong idea. They've told you it's misfolded proteins, it's reactive oxygen species, you know, it's prions, it's tau, all, amyloid, all this stuff. But the reality is when you look at it, at the heart of Alzheimer's is an insufficiency. You have an insufficiency of signaling which is picked up by this molecule, APP, which then is protecting your brain for downsizing. It's very much, by the way, what's happened with COVID-19. We have an insult, SARS-CoV-2, and of course, we're supposed to be uh, sheltering in place and social distancing. But what's happened with that, with less interaction, we have a recession. This is exactly what goes on in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. You have insults, and these are everything from herpes simplex type 1, P. gingivalis from your mouth, various molds from your sinuses, leaky gut, as you know, on and on and on, mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of these things. And these insults trigger your brain to say, okay, I need to downsize. I need to shelter in place, literally. And it produces something that is an antimicrobial, which is the amyloid. So uh, and as long as you don't find those things and correct them, you're going to keep downsizing, downsizing until you can't dress yourself, you can't speak. And unfortunately, when you go in to see some doctor, an expert in Alzheimer's, they don't look for those things. And this is a critical piece. So what we studied was, what is the fundamental nature of this problem? And the nature of it, it is an insufficiency in the network that mediates plasticity. And so what happens, you lose that plasticity and you start downsizing just what, as you what see is with plasticity? COVID-19. What is plasticity? Right. So plasticity is the ability to change, you know, from plasticos in the Greek, something that, that is moldable. So the ability to mold your brain, to add new thoughts, to add new memories, this is exactly what is lost in this disease because that is the network that is now downsized. It's basically saying, okay, Mark, can you live with a, with a fewer synapses so that we can fight these things? You're, you're going to use your resources now to fight the various pathogens or toxins or you know, changes in insulin sensitivity and things like that but you're going to have to live with a smaller function, basically, just as we are stuck with with the recession here in the United States right now. Yeah, so your neuroplasticity is essentially all the networks that tie everything together in your brain, right. all the connections between the cells, all the messaging, all the right. new wiring that helps you learn and grow. That diminishes with all these insults that right. cause your brain to, as you say, downsize. Yeah, uh, it is protecting and, itself. And what we've always learned is that once – you go down, you're not going back up. That once you lose your memory, it ain't coming back. And that the best we can do is maybe slow it down. And right. the best research, uh, and we're talking about billions of dollars, hundreds of studies over many decades, have yeah. really come up with a big fat zero when it comes to any meaningful result to right. stop, to slow, or to treat Alzheimer's or dementia. And, and uh, we, we've spent so much money and got so little because we've been focusing on the wrong thing. So in your program, the End of Alzheimer's program, you talk about what we actually should be focusing on. And you talk about these metabolic factors that can literally trigger this downsizing. So what right. are those factors and, and how do we rebalance them so we don't end up having this decline in brain function? Yes, yeah, a great point. And so, you know, we can actually see people improve, just as you described in your 2007 book. Uh, and so this shows that there is a set of things that are synaptoblastic, making mm -hmm. connections and keeping connections, and a set of things that are synaptoclastic, pulling back. And when you're young, there's this beautiful balance. You know, you're actively forgetting the seventh song that played on the radio in the work yesterday and stuff, that sort of thing. But then what happens with everybody with Alzheimer's, too high on the synaptoclastic, too low on the synaptoblastic side. So what are the things that are synaptoblastic? Well, 
step one, we, there is an energy gap. This turns out to be one of the most important parts about the Alzheimer's brain. As you know, if you just look at a PET scan, an FDG PET scan, you see that there is a decrease in the utilization of glucose by your temporal lobe and your parietal lobe. That is the hallmark, the signature of Alzheimer's disease, and it's present for about 10 years before a diagnosis. So you have a critical energy gap that you need to change. You need to address that gap. And the best way to do it, of course, is with ketosis. And you can, mm. you know, Stephen Kinane showed years ago, you can ramp those ketones up to one, two, three millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate, and you can, you can address that energy gap. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing mm. is when we used to grow the neurons. So basically in, using a ketogenic diet, you can absolutely. increase the way the brain uses energy and make it basically have more energy by feeding it fat instead of sugar and carbs. Exactly. And there are two problems there. One is that you've lost the flexibility. You've lost the ability. Everyone's stuck on the glucose side. They're not able to use the ketone side. You have to have the flexibility. And then the second is that they have the insulin resistance. So that even though they're trying to use the glucose, which is what they've used for years and years and years because of the standard American diet, they're now unable to do that because you literally have changes in the ability of insulin to signal. You change your insulin signaling IRS1 molecule from tyrosine phosphorylation, which is active, to serine and threonine phosphorylation, which is inactive. You literally shut it down. And when we used to grow neurons in a dish, you know, in the so lab- So basically what you're saying is that sugar kind of screws up your brain's ability to metabolize energy. Is that what you're saying? As, that's exactly right. Okay, because yeah. I don't even know what tyrosine and serine is, but I, mean, I think that's a basic take home point is that when you eat sugar, your brain doesn't like it and it starts to shut down and it leads to Alzheimer's. It, it becomes resistant to it, exactly right. It, resistant to the insulin effects, which are so critical for keeping your neurons alive. So the beautiful thing here is that what we saw in the lab reflected beautifully what you and David Perlmutter and Jeffrey Bland were saying clinically. So that the, you know, if we hadn't had all the great work you did, we would have been stuck. Say, okay, what's the next step we take now from the lab? But here's this beautiful functional medicine all ready to plug in the underlying science of Alzheimer's disease. So in that sense, very helpful. And as you said, very, you, you, sugar damages your ability to support your synapses. So you've got to address with ketones, you've got to address the energy, you've got to adjust the insulin uh, sensitivity, you've got to get insulin sensitive instead of insulin resistant, which virtually everybody with Alzheimer's is. And then you have to have, you have to reduce any inflammation. Your brain responds to inflammation by saying, I am being attacked. There's some organism out there. So I'm going to make this amyloid, which kills these microorganisms. But in so doing, I, again, I'm downsizing. So you've got to get rid of that inflammation, not just get rid of the inflammation, resolve it, but you also have to find out what's causing it and address that. So those are the first three things. And then you've got to have the support. You've got to have hormones and trophic factors and nutrients that are critical for rebuilding those synapses. Fortunately, before you actually lose the neurons, you first lose the efficiency of the synapses. The synapses don't work well, but they're still in place, thankfully. Yeah. So when we do the right things, these start mm. working well again. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember reading this article, because what you're talking about is, is multiple different factors that explain the phenomena we see as dementia, but that it's not yep. one disease, that it's yes. many diseases and many dysfunctions rep manifesting as a particular set of symptoms that are common among people, but it doesn't tell you why. So everybody you look at who's got cognitive decline or Alzheimer's, you have to be a detective and find out what is their particular issue. Is it more insulin resistance? Is it more of an infection? Is it a mold? Is it a toxin? Is it some other nutritional deficiency or hormonal lack? Like too much of something, not enough of something else. And what's really uh, striking is that the inflammation is this common theme in all brain dysfunction, whether it's depression or ADD or autism or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whatever, it's inflammation in the brain. And so a lot of your work has really been in understanding what is driving that inflammation. Because the amyloid, like you said, is not the problem. It's actually your body's attempt to fix the problem. Yeah. Exactly. It's the band-aid that the body uses and uh, to deal with the inflammation and the microbial factors, which often can come from gut and other factors. So talk to us about how 
you know, we need to rethink this because I, I uh, remember reading this article years ago in JAMA, which was called Shifting Thinking About Dementia. And there was right. a great line in there that says, we combine uh, categorical misclassification with ideologic imprecision. And what that means in English yeah. is that we, we categorize people according to symptoms, not causes. Right. And we are not really good at finding the ideology or the cause, right? So right. Right. we're kind of just like throwing you know, spaghetti at the wall, trying to see what works. And what you've done with the Bredesen Protocol and the End of Alzheimer's Program is to really map out systematically the ways in which you can identify those factors that are harming your brain. Right. We call, you call them dementogens. Right. 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 <laughs> and, and what are those factors that we need to provide the body to optimize and enhance brain function? Right? Exactly. So, you know, what's, what happens in COVID-19, again, is cytokines. And so, you know, cytokines are killing people, as you know, the cytokine storm is the problem. Well, part of the inflammatory cascade, part of your innate immune system activation is amyloid. So we mm. have to quit thinking of amyloid as the cause of Alzheimer's. Amyloid is just like cytokine storm, except it's longer. Of course, yeah. COVID-19 has compressed all the things that go wrong in Alzheimer's into two weeks instead of 20 years. But it's mm -hmm. the same idea. As long as you have something that is saying, hey, something's wrong with your brain, you are going to continue to make that amyloid. That's part of the response. So you're absolutely right. You have to determine what these factors are. And it's often, there are often biotoxins or organic toxins or metallotoxins, air pollution, of course, has turned out to be a big one. So all of these critical things and then various pathogens, and there are several of these chronic pathogens from Babesia to Bartonella to Borrelia to various uh, mold species uh, to herpes simplex type 1 to HHV6A. These are all chronic pathogens. And typically, as you know, we don't know that we have them. So as you said, you know, this is interesting to me that the we, we used to talk about people dying of fever. You know, in the 1600s, mm -hmm. people died mm -hmm. of fever all the time. And mm. so now people talk about people dying of Alzheimer's. It's no different than fever. You shouldn't have a period after fever and be fever due to what? And you shouldn't put a period after Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's due to what? That's the right. critical piece. And so the doctors have always put the period. They say, you have Alzheimer's. But we need to know why for each person. And it's not one thing. It's not like tuberculosis. It's always the tuberculosis. Right. It's all these different things. So that's, it is a systems disease. That's the point. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I think uh, in, you know, in, in, in uh, neurology, there's a famous uh, joke that uh, the, the, you see the doctor and it's basically diagnose and adios. Here's the exactly. name for the condition you have and there's not much we can do about it. Goodbye. <laughs> Get your yeah. life in order. Yeah. And that makes me crazy because, you know, over 25 years of doing this and working with people's brains, I wrote about this 12 years ago. I've seen more and more since then mm -hmm. of how we can really impact these patients. I mean, I, I saw a patient who had uh, dementia. She had Lewy body dementia, which is sort of a sort of combo of Alzheimer's and, yeah. and Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. She couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair. Uh, she had real cognitive issues. She was trying to run her business. She couldn't function anymore. And we, we essentially did this detective work that you're talking about using the approach that's described in the end of Alzheimer's program in the Bredesen Protocol. And we found she had tremendous gut issues, tremendous overgrowth of bacteria in yeast in her gut, massive nutritional deficiency. She was diabetic, poorly controlled. Her thyroid wasn't working. She was postmenopausal and had all these various issues. And we simply corrected those things that we found. And she came back incredibly. And her energy came back. Her cognitive function came back. She was able to be in her business again. She was able to, she was a relatively famous person, was able to record another album and write songs and write a book and where she'd been totally dysfunctional and non-functional before and was able to even get up out of her wheelchair and start walking. Uh, so it's quite remarkable. And this was even in over 80 years old. So no matter where you are in the spectrum, we see these yeah. remarkable changes that people just don't think are possible. And when right. you talk to traditional doctors about it, they kind of dismiss it. But, the, you know, there, there has been research on this. You know, one, one of our colleagues, and you've, you've published a number of papers uh, looking at these case studies, but one of our colleagues, Richard Isaacson, did an incredible study that, that looked at uh, similar kind of personalized interventions, not even the full protocol, and right. saw that he could not only stop, but he could slow it, and he could also reverse some of the symptoms of cognitive decline. So can you, can you talk a little bit more about 
you know, what, what kind of approaches you do to, to looking at the factors that are going on and maybe sort of list some of the key factors that you're finding that are common uh, among, among these patients. Yeah, and I think the best way to do that is to talk about the subtypes. So what we described back in two, published back in 2015 is when you start to look at these to do the very evaluation that you just talked about, mm. then in fact what you find is that there are people, although there are multiple contributors, people tend to have specific subtypes. So type 1 inflammatory, these are people who have exposure, uh, they may have leaky gut, they may have periodontitis, uh, they may have metabolic syndrome, lots of reasons that they have inflammation. And that's the critical driver. And you can literally follow the molecular pathway from NF-kappa B activation, part of the inflammatory pathway, to where it's producing the amyloid, which, as I mentioned, is part of the inflammatory pathway. So that's the type 1. And those people, you need to look for things like HSCRP, uh, TNF-alpha, things like that. And then you need to use resolvins to improve these. And then you need to identify where this is coming from and attack that. So getting, again, upstream is critical. Then there's type 2, which is atrophic, and these are the people where they have low vitamin D, pregnenolone, progesterone, estradiol, testosterone, you know, on and on. The critical supports for this nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, B12, all these things. It takes, as you know, it takes a lot to keep a brain functional. You have over 500 trillion synapses in your head. You've got an amazing supercomputer inside your skull. So you've got to keep that supported and you know, prevent it from downsizing. Again, this is a disease of insufficiency. And by the way, one of the most common things we're seeing now, nocturnal hypoxia. People don't realize it. The doctors don't check it. They say, oh, I don't snore. I don't need to look at this. And it turns out that when you actually actually look at it, you see that the oxygen has crept down during the night into the 80s, even into the 70s. We see people in the low 70s who don't realize that they have problems with oxygenation. So Huge sleep apnea, issue. you mean? Sleep apnea. It's, it's often without sleep. That's the key. Some wow. of the sleep apnea is the tip of the iceberg, but there's upper airway resistance syndrome as another one of these. And there are people who just don't get enough oxygen at night, even though they don't have full-blown sleep apnea. So that's critical to check. And then, of course, we talked about the ketones earlier. Then there's the type 1.5, which is glycotoxic. And this is the people where they've got both inflama uh, inflammatory changes because of glycation of hundreds of proteins. And they've also got the atrophic effect because they now have resistance to the insulin. So that's type 1.5 or glycotoxic. Those are the factors. You got to look at their hemoglobin A1C, their HOMA IR, stuff like that. And glycotoxic means sugar being toxic to the brain and it forms these yeah. crusts sort of like a creme brulee on the top of your brain. <laughs> so it can't really work properly. And then you talk about atrophic, which means lack of things to help the brain grow. Trophic factors are essentially the fuel or the food or the the ingredients that the brain needs to function, including hormones and the right nutrients and vitamins and, and fish oil, all kinds of stuff that the brain actually needs to function. Yeah. So, so you, you talk about Support. the way you identify this. And I thought this was brilliant the first time I heard about it. You know, everybody knows they should get a colonoscopy to check their colon. But you come up with this term called a cognoscopy, which right. I exactly. love, which is essentially how do you do a deep dive into your brain and all the things that affect your brain that cause risk of cognitive issues. And by the way, the, all the things that you measure with a cognoscopy are all the things we measure for any chronic illness to look at. And some are more prevalent in different illnesses. But with Alzheimer's, you really come up with a model of a cognoscopy. So can you talk about what is a cognoscopy? What should we be looking for? How do we get it? Can we get it with our regular doctor? Or is this something that you really need specialized care for? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And people have told me, don't use that term cognoscopy. It sounds so I horrible. Love it. I but it's love simple. It. It's easy to remember. It. And we all know we should get a colonoscopy when we turn 50. So we recommend everybody 45 or over get a cognoscopy. And as you said, it, it is things related to chronic illness. But the key is to prioritize. I mean, that's the key. The people who are getting the best results, as you know, are the ones who are prioritizing the things that are the most important drivers. It's different for each person. For some person, you know, it's going to be getting at that Borrelia. For the other person, it's going to be getting at that mycotoxin. And for another person, it's going to be the glycotoxicity. So today it's very simple to get so a one might be mold, one might be mold. lime, one might be sugar, right? Sugar, what, one sugar, might be yeah. mercury, might be mercury. 
right? Yeah. And might be vascular. A common one is people just don't have the vascular support for their brain. And this is why they are downsizing. And so if we return that support, we return the oxygenation and the blood flow, they do better. So the way you can get a cognoscopy, in it, it is three things. It is number one, a set of blood and urine tests, easy to do. Uh, number two, uh, it is a simple online cognitive assessment. And if you're completely asymptomatic and doing great and you're just in for prevention, you can stop there, just those two things. If you have any symptoms or you're not scoring well on the cognitive tests, you want to include number three, which is an MRI with volumetrics. You want to know the volume of your hippocampus. You want to know the volumes of your frontal lobes and your parietal lobes and things like that. And hippocampus so, is that so little memory center in the brain tends to shrink right and I've, I've heard you present some cases that when you've done these cognoscopies you start these interventions that are yeah. in the end of Alzheimer's program your new book which everybody should get and you map out the changes over time when you implement the Bredesen protocol and the yeah. and remember the story you told of the neurologist the neuroradiologist who looked right. at the scans and was like this is before and this is after this is doesn't make any sense. I've never seen this in my entire life to go from like 20% of what it should be to 70 or 80 or 90% of what it should be. Can right. you explain how that happens? Absolutely. And, you know, we see this again and again and again. We're actually just publishing another paper showing not only increase in hippocampal volume, but also improvement in PET scans, where you go from a PET scan that shows Alzheimer's to a PET scan that doesn't show Alzheimer's. We also see improvements in electrophysiology. So improvements in EEG, improvements in evoked responses, and of course, improvements repeatedly in cognitive scoring and testing. So this is happening because you are putting the things in that actually support the brain, you're getting hormones and trophic factors that are critical. So the brain is now making the synapses once again. Now, we don't know yet, is it making more neurons? Is it making just more synapses? Is it changing in terms of its astrogliosis? We don't yet know what's happening at the cellular level, but we do know that that atrophy is improving in many of these people. So, so you said two things there that sort of struck me. One is that your brain can grow. You can rebuild brain tissue that's been damaged by right. the insults and literally right. grow your memory center, which correlates with improved cognitive function on the, the brain cognitive testing. And right. second, you said you can do a brain scan that you can see Alzheimer's on. You can repeat right. the brain scan and the Alzheimer's markers on the brain scan are gone. gone. Like that, that's like what? Stop presses, headline news. Why isn't this on the cover of New England Journal, JAMA, cover of New York Times, Wall Street Journal. What, what, what's going on here? Yeah, well, it, partly because, of course, the standard is, you know, do a thousand people and then do the whole study. So, you know, at the beginning, you have to, you have to start somewhere. You know, we're just getting the airplane off the ground, you got to start somewhere. So we're looking, as you said, at these various cases. We are in the midst, I should say, of the, you know, the first trial in history in which we look at all the different contributors for each person and do all, address all these different things. We'll be finished with that in December. So very enthusiastic about that trial. But yes, we do see in in these you know, anecdotes that we're now looking at, we see improvements in PET scanning and electrophysiology and, and hippocampal volume and all these things. Uh, when you are getting these people to improve and to do the right things, you're literally just restoring a synaptoblastic neurochemistry. And what that means is you're creating a brain that likes to build new brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is capable. And, you know, it's over almost 30 years ago it was discovered. It was, of course, I was taught years and years ago that, the, you know, the brain doesn't make new neurons. You get the ones you have and that's it. And then about 30 years ago, it became clear that, hey, there are neural stem cells and you actually do make new neurons throughout life. And so it's a question of which ones do you keep and do you have, do you have them interact with other neurons? Do they become part of the functional network? So it turns out you do make more of them. And if you do the right things, you can keep them and you can keep their interactions. Now, uh, one of the big topics that you cover is the microbiome, leaky gut, inflammation, yeah. Alzheimer's. And so most neurologists aren't saying, well, let me look at your digestive system. Let me look at your gut and seeing if there's inflammation there. And how does that connect to yeah. the brain? And you know, we talked to a colleague of ours, Rudy Tanzi, who's yeah. been pioneering some of the work around finding microbes in the brain. We thought the brain was sterile. We thought the brain right. had a blood-brain barrier that prevented anything bad from getting in. Well, it turns out that barrier is only semi-permeable and right. that things can get in 
and, and they can be even microbes. Uh, so can you talk about this amazing new research on the gut and the brain and the microbiome and how that impacts what we have to do with patients with Alzheimer's? And by the way, that, that patient that I had who had really had brain dysfunction, her main issue was her gut. And we fixed yeah. it up after decades of being constipated and eating uh, enemas to go to the bathroom and laxatives and tons of bad bugs growing in there. It was just amazing what happened. We fixed all of that. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, when a neurologist makes a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, the best thing the neurologist can do is refer the patient to a functional medicine doctor to deal with all the things that are driving this problem. But of course, the neurologists have felt like, oh, this is our province. You know, we have to give the drug and watch you go downhill, which is really unfortunate. I think that's going to change. So absolutely, uh, the, you know, the gut is a driver. And I think one of the most interesting studies that was done in the last couple of years was a group, they were actually studying rodents, but what they were doing was injecting candida. And they thought, they wanted to see how long does the blood-brain barrier keep the candida. They injected it into the blood vessels and asked, okay, what happens when it goes by the brain? How long can the brain keep it out? And the answer was, it went in immediately. So wow. there is, yeah, candida, and this is in a normal animal. So the fact of the matter is, there is much more communication, just as you pointed out, and as Rudy has been pointing out, there is much more communication between the brain and the periphery than any one thought possible. And what have the pathologists shown us? When they look in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's, what do they see? Herpes simplex in the brain. They see candida in the brain. They see Borrelia in the brain. They see P. gingivalis from your dentition in the brain. From gum disease. All these different gum disease. So the bottom line is our brains are communicating with the periphery much more than anyone thought before. And as you said, we actually probably have a normal brain, as much as that kind of blows my mind, we, we, we actually probably do have a normal brain microbiome, and we're going to have to have probiotics for our brain at some point. Cognobiotics, right? <laughs> Cognobiotics, yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, wow, that's incredible. Well, you know, the, the approach also that um, is needed is something we don't do in traditional medicine, which is how do you restore a healthy microbiome, right? And yep, this is what the absolutely. focus of functional medicine is, how do you take the symptoms that people have, or even they may not have any symptoms in the gut, but look at the environment in there and optimize it by taking out the bad stuff, putting in the good stuff and using the functional medicine approach to really heal the gut. So I think what you're saying is that, is that each patient is different and, and some may have gut issues, some may have other issues. So, you know, one of the other issues that really affects people is heavy metals. And, and there's been you know, a lot of talk in the past about aluminum and Alzheimer's, but it was sort of, you know, sort of ignored. And, and I, re I remember a patient I had, one of the first patients that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with Alzheimer's. This patient's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. Um, I have no clue if anything I'm going to do is going to work, but I'm going to try my basic framework of functional medicine to see if we can just yeah. take out the bad stuff and put in the good stuff. So I did a cognoscopy of sorts, yeah. got rid of the dementogens. And mm -hmm. what was really striking about this guy, Dale, was he was seven years old. He was a CEO of his major family business, couldn't function at all, sort of was in the corner, basically depressed and not functioning. Nobody wanted to be around him. And he had pretty significant dementia. Um, but when I looked at his story, he grew up in Pittsburgh and he lived in Pittsburgh and there's yeah, steel yeah. plants there. And almost every patient of mine from Pittsburgh is mercury toxic because they put coal ash on the streets, yeah. they put it on the fields, gets in the right. food, uh, it's in the air. And he had a mouthful of fillings. And norm you know, normally when you do a challenge test for mercury with a patient in functional medicine, you know, you see a level of 20 or 50. That's like, you worry about that. That's high. Yeah. Um, a hundred, you know, I've had, a, you know, maybe 20 in my whole life of doing pay me 10 to 20,000 tests. His was 350. <laughs> I'd never Whoa. seen anything like that. Yeah. I had one other patient, I think I had 400, but almost nobody like that. And, and I got rid of his fillings. We detoxed him from the mercury. He also had all these genes like APOE double four. He had yeah. methylation gene problems. It has to do with the vitamins. He had genes that affect insulin resistance. He had years of gut issues. He'd had irritable, irritable bowel for decades and was on Stelazine for his gut. Uh, and mm. so he had all these, all these issues that we treated. So we fixed his insulin and blood sugar. We fixed his gut. We fixed his B vitamins. We got rid of the mercury. And the guy literally came back like Rip Van Winkle from the dead. And it was the most striking thing I'd ever seen in my life. I was like, holy cow, like I yeah. just 
cured Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, and this was like probably that? 15 years ago. And I'm like, yeah. what? And, and, and it was, that was really began the process of me going, wait a minute, the brain is so fixable if we understand the insults, which yeah. you have mapped out so well in the end of Alzheimer's. And if we understand how to actually repair and heal the system. So talk about mercury and the metals and how these affect the brain. Cause this is a, this is not to say that everybody with Alzheimer's has heavy metals. So they don't, but I've had a number of patients that makes a huge difference when you deal with it. Yeah. But as, as you said, you know, a, a certain number of them, that is the key piece. And here's the thing, you know, I mentioned earlier, your brain makes amyloid when it is under attack by microbes because it's trying to kill the microbes. But interestingly, the gene itself that amyloid comes from, which is called amyloid precursor protein, is a gene that is responsive to metals. So there's literally a metal binding region on the RNA, this piece that's going to be making the protein. So it is, it responds to mercury, it responds to copper, zinc, iron. So mm. this thing is part of what's binding up those metals. So it actually binds up. So what happens is you can actually give mercury, and as you indicated, mercury is literally a cause of Alzheimer's. Not in everybody, but in a small group of people, probably something like three to five percent of all Alzheimer's patients, which still is a lot of them, there are going to be 45 million people with it who are the currently living Americans. 45 million of us will develop Alzheimer's during our lifetime. Five percent so is a couple issue. of million of people have metal issues. Exactly. This is a big problem. So you, this is why, as you said, you want to check this on everybody because if that's one of the contributors, you need to deal with it. And when you do, they do better. And it does, it increases the production of the amyloid and it both, interestingly, it induces the amyloid and it induces the tau as well. So it is a great way. If you want to give yourself Alzheimer's, take some uh, mercury. <laughs> Eat some sushi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some but, you know, tuna sushi. Thing, but the funny thing is, you know, that not everybody accumulates the mercury and it's a lot has right. to do with genetic right. variation. I personally had mercury toxicity and I had cognitive dysfunction. I felt like I had dementia. Really, I did. My level wasn't 350. It was 187, which is bad enough. Still, yeah. And still bad enough. And so I, I, I understand from a personal point of view what this does. And it's one of the most potent toxins on the planet, probably second only to plutonium. It is the most yeah. potent neurotoxin. And, and it's just it's inconscionable to me that we don't, as a profession, really think about the role of toxins. We check the blood levels, but that doesn't really reflect the total body burden of these metals. And so there are ways through functional medicine and the approach you're talking about to really do this. Let's Absolutely. talk about um, the next topic, which is you know hormones. And I think uh, you know I've seen mm -hmm. some really interesting responses to hormones around thyroid, sex hormones. Uh, this is what we call a trophic factor. So it's not something that's hurting you, it's something that you're lacking that your right. brain needs to function. So talk about some of the big hormonal findings and what you're seeing with these patients. Yeah, and there's some elegant work uh, published out of the Mayo Clinic a number of years ago where they simply looked at women who had oophorectomies for whatever reason. Take at their the ovaries age of, out. Let's say take their move ovaries Move it up out. the ovaries, right, uh, at the age of 40 or younger who did not get BHRT versus one who did not get hormone replacement versus those who did get hormone replacement. And even though the hormone replacement has been imperfect for many of these, there was a striking difference. The ones who did not get the hormone replacement had a more than doubling of the risk for developing Alzheimer's, even though the Alzheimer's wasn't diagnosed till years later. Wow. Wow. It goes perfectly with the science that we talked about earlier. This APP is looking for support. And when it does not get that support, it's flipping over to the synaptoclastic. It's saying, we can't support this brain. And it goes beyond just estradiol to progesterone and pregnenolone and testosterone and vitamin D and all these things thyroid hormone as well. These are all critical. And so repeatedly, people have come upon the fact that you're getting this at the time often when you're losing those hormones or down the road from this. And we see a lot of people now, uh, something I never saw when I was training, people who are in their 50s, women who are going through menopause or perimenopause who have their first symptoms at that time. So wow. for a number of reasons, it's huge. Not only the support side, but also as Dr. Chris Shade has pointed out, 
progesterone is one of the most critical parts for your detoxification apparatus. So when you now get this relative lowering of so-called you know, relative uh, estradiol excess or estrogen excess, um, this is because you've, you've lost both, but you've lost the progesterone to a greater extent. You are at increased risk for toxin-related Alzheimer's disease, and you're now getting this synaptoclastic burst. You are re-releasing these toxins, including mercury, that you have sequestered Westered for so many years. So by multiple mechanisms, having too low a support from your hormones is a critical risk factor for cognitive decline. Yeah. And there is controversy about hormone replacement, particularly around cancer. Yeah. And yeah. do you worry about that? Do, absolutely. And so I think it's critical to have people see experts in this area, you know, Dr. Anne Hathaway, Dr. You know, Prudence Hall, and many people who are BHRT experts uh, who look at, you know, when's the best time to do this? What are the best doses? Where, you know, when, uh, if you, uh, can you improve, get, can you get the better outcome than this worry? And yeah, there is a worry about cancer, although some of the studies have actually shown reduced with appropriate use of estrogen and progesterone, reduced likelihood of cancer. It's clear that you, by different mechanisms, aerobic, that part, and the strength training, they have different and complementary features. But there's also the coordination feature, so-called neuromotor. And now we're seeing there's also an issue with blood flow. So things like katsu bands are turning out to be helpful. And as you know, probably know, these were used by a number of the Olympic athletes who are training. This is where when you're doing your training, you have bands that are somewhat restrictive. They don't cut off the completely the blood, the blood flow, but they are somewhat restrictive. And they're basically telling your muscles, you need to improve the flow. And so, in fact, after you use these, people actually get improved flow, not only to their muscles, but to their wow. brains. Wow. And so that's one way to go. And then, of course, EWOT, uh, exercise with oxygen therapy. Uh, where you're doing both, you're, you're doing the exercise, but you're also delivering a higher oxygen to your brain. Because again, this is a disease in which there is an insufficiency in support of this complex neuroplasticity network. So, you know, as you indicated, getting the appropriate amount of insulin sensitivity, uh, very important, but also getting the blood flow and the oxygenation. And of course, we've heard repeatedly with COVID-19, You've got all these in, the same sorts of things are impacted. Now you've got less blood flow. You've got less oxygenation. You've got more inflammation. So unfortunately, people who've had this um, are at increased risk for cognitive decline and really should all be on prevention for cognitive decline. And the exercise is key because that's one of the very powerful drivers of neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So yeah. when you want to increase your brain's connectivity and function yeah. and cells, the best way to do it is exercise and and the high intensity training the strength training the various kinds of uh, oxygen supported exercise there it's, it's actually precision exercise prescriptions too it's not just you know just take a walk it's more than that uh, and then point. and then sleep also is really important a lot of people have sleep apnea many people are miss it poor sleep quality and sleep has a huge effect on the brain so talk to about how, how we sort of evaluate and, and assess sleep yeah, and again, there are multiple things and multiple factors that will drive the sleep down and make it less helpful. Of course, starting with the amount of sleep, so many people waking up in the middle of the night ruminating about various things, that can be addressed. As you mentioned, sleep apnea, but there are also people who have other reasons for nocturnal hypoxemia. So again, you know, wearables are going to be very helpful here. So whether you like to use an Apple Watch or you like to use a stick an oximeter on your finger, borrow one from your physician, or you can get them online, very inexpensive. Uh, and you can check to see where your oxygenation is at night. And you should be sitting up in the 96 to 98 percent. And we see people all the time that are down into the 80s and even into the 70s. These people are starving their brains for oxygen at night. And it could be from sleep apnea, but it can also be from upper airway resistance syndrome, another way, which, by the way, that also increases your adrenaline, which then wakes you up. So and then, of course, people who have low hormones you tend to sleep poorly, especially if your progesterone is low, you tend to sleep poorly. So all of these things can collude to give you a poor sleep. And that's a such a critical time. And of course, so many of us, you know, we have situations where we say, well, we just can't afford to sleep that much. We've got a lot of stuff going on at night. We've got a lot of stuff going on early in the morning. So we're just not going to get sleep. Well, that, that's a short-term solution. That's not a long-term solution. No. And then brain training and stress management too, meditation, these things do affect the brain. I remember 
uh, listening to uh, uh, some scientists talk about the ways in which meditation actually improves connectivity in the brain, neuroplasticity, brain cells, reduce inflammation. So it's not just, oh, just to relax. There's actually right. science around how it actually affects the brain in a positive way. You know, it's interesting. If you simply look at people's cortisol levels, as the cortisol levels go up, the brain size goes down. And so, in fact, when we were uh, developing uh, drugs over the many years in the lab for Alzheimer's, one of the things that came out that was very interesting is that there is a cortisol or it's a corticotropin releasing factor, so CRF1 receptor in the brain, in the hippocampus, and blocking this actually improved both the amyloid and the tau in the brain. So, in fact, the, the whole stress pathway is absolutely part of cognitive decline. Yes, fine to have some transient stress and then respond to it. That's great. That's what we're made to do. But this, as you know, this chronic stress for many, many years is damaging to your brain. It's damaging to your, your vessels. You get the hypertension, you know, on and on with all these problems, poor sleep, etc. And so addressing that is very helpful. And as you indicated, um, some form of meditation, whether it's TM, whether it's mindfulness, what have you, um, very helpful as well in this whole system. Getting that stress when your brain feels that stress and threat and your amygdala is responding to this, um, the, one part of the response is, okay, we, we, we can't deal with the, the brain that we have. We're going to have to kind of downsize a little bit. Um, and so you want to get rid of that as well. And then there's you know targeted supplementation and there's detoxification and then addressing the various things that you've identified, such as mycotoxins, which takes can take years yeah. uh, to reduce these things, but it's well worth it because it keeps you out of a nursing home and keeps you sharp. The most common thing we hear from people is, oh my gosh, my spouse is so much more engaged since yeah. he or she has been doing this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you, you, so you go through all these various modalities, like ex right. diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, brain training, which essentially is using, basically I think about, you know, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, those kinds of things. But there's actually software that allows you to really scientifically improve your brain. It's like brainer size, uh, like brain yes. HQ. So those, you include that. And then, and then what's really fascinating is you then start to go into how do we facilitate the brain to grow and to heal and repair? You call these trophic factors. Trophic means to grow. And, yes. and so you use hormones, right? And you use estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. And then nutrients, so you, so you replace all the missing nutrients and the key things like vitamin D, omega-3s, B vitamins, all these really help. And then you focus on the gut, right? You focus on fixing the gut if that's a problem. You start dealing with the infections and, and the inflammation causes. Uh, you start addressing the toxins, the mold. So this is all part of a functional medicine approach. And I found this incredibly effective um, for so many patients. And what really I sort of want to sort of talk about is what you found in the study. Now you did all these things with these patients and you did, you did a follow up to look at brain size, to look at, you know, cognitive performance on standardized testing. You looked at all the biomarkers. What, what were the, the big findings and takeaways from the study? Yeah. The, I think the, the, the big takeaway from the study is that for virtually everyone, Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's can be reversed, that you can reverse this problem by addressing the things that are causing it. And we know now from people who've been on this since 2012, we had our first patients go on this in 2012, they are still better. So th wow. again, this is something that was unheard of before because with a drug, you may get a little bump, but then you go right back to declining. And unfortunately, when you look out at five years, the people who went on these drugs typically are just as bad or worse than the ones who yeah. didn't go on them. So with this, you, you improve and then you stay improved because you're actually addressing the root cause, just as you've mentioned. So I think the big takeaway was the vast majority of these people could get better. And then secondly, the, the few who didn't, you could see why they didn't. You could see what wasn't addressed. You could see if they stopped doing the right things. And then thirdly, we've got, as I say, the, the sustaining of this. Uh, and then, of course, the fourth takeaway would be that you've got to get the people to change their biochemistry. So you've got to get them into that mild ketosis. You've got to make them insulin sensitive. So as the metabolism goes, so goes the cognition. And of course, you know, we, we now need to look at, OK, what do we need to do to make this even better, better, better? Uh, but this is a this is a wonderful start, and we're seeing you know we, we saw on average um, 
increasing in scores of 3.89, as opposed to, for example, the drug that was just considered a success, aducanumab, no improvement, no stabilization, but in one trial at one dose only, the decline slowed by 22%. That was the, that was the exciting result. So basically, none of these drugs work, and at best, they'll slow you down a little bit, so maybe you won't end up in a nursing home for six months more than you, right? It's like, we're not talking about any great breakthroughs here. Everybody gets so excited, we're in this drug, and it's billions of dollars, and it's so expensive, and healthcare pays for it, but this kind of approach is not something that's really funded by health insurance, so it's pretty frustrating for people. Absolutely. And then, of course, there's big discussions now, right now, about who is going to pay if aducanumab is now, since it's been approved back on June 7th, who will pay if you go in and get this drug that may slow the decline slightly? And of course, your Cleveland Clinic has come out saying that they're not going to pay for this. Medicare is still deciding. The VA has decided we will not pay for this, about $100,000 per year. $56,000 for the drug, and then additional for the infusions, for the PET scans, for the MRIs, for all the other things you need. So it's extremely expensive. And of course, the the people who develop Alzheimer's spend on average $350,000 per person by the time they pass away. Much of that, of course, is nursing homes. So it's it's, as you said, this is the most expensive disease. Um, mm. you, you, it's, we're over $300 billion now in the United States per year wow. because of all the lost wages, the people who are the caregivers, the medications, mm-hmm. the nursing homes, all these sorts of things. It's truly heartbreaking. Uh, and mm. so taking this sort of approach, where, as you indicated, you, you look at all these things and now you address all these things that have failed, get you back to a system that functions again, makes all the difference. And it's amazing. I mean, you, 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 you did very rigorous science looking at all the standardized tests that a traditional neurologist would look at, like at CNS Vital Signs, they call the MOCA test, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. You looked at brain training right. scores that are objective scores, looking at how people improve. You look at brain MRI. I mean, how do you even get something more objective than looking at someone's brain size? And you saw changes right. in brain size and in volume of the hippocampus, which is the memory center, which is really right. staggering when you, when you think about it. So, you know, even if you're only 10% right, <laughs> it's still a it's still a major breakthrough, right? And I, I I'm wondering why why do you think we ha- you haven't been able to sort of get funding from the NIH or you know major uh, Alzheimer's so group, groups? What do you think the sort of resistance is that's kind of behind this? Because it just seems like this is so obvious to me. The results are there. You've got preliminary data. Why don't we just put our um, chips on that bet and double down and and go for it? Yeah, it's a great point. And I think you know, that there's a system is in place. As you know, there is no place in the United States that is teaching, no medical school other than yours, that is teaching functional medicine to part. And I actually talked to uh, the, the vice chancellor of one of the greatest um, universities in the country in terms of the medical school, who said, you know, we'd like to teach this new medicine. Uh, but we can't do that until all doctors accept it. Well, of course, all doctors won't accept it until you teach it in medical school. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck in this loop of, you know, let's do things the old fashioned way. And I think it will take a continued, you know, it'll take more trials to show that this is clearly superior. I do think in the long run, it's going to be combining targeted drugs with an overall protocol like a a functional medicine protocol like this, that's going to get you the best outcomes because these targeted drugs are very good at what they do. It's just that, as you indicated earlier, they close one hole out of the 36 holes. So you're still, you've got a lot open, but having them for targeted things is going to be very helpful. So I'm hoping at some point that the drug companies will understand that their drugs will work better on the backbone of these. And I think when that happens, things will slowly start to improve. But, you know, look what happened, Mark, Uh, with the opioid scandal, there was coercion. Because there were billions of dollars at stake, there was a whole infrastructure set up. There was coercion for doctors. Do do this, make us lots of money. And, you know, to some extent, Alzheimer's currently is the new opioid scandal. There is coercion. There is an infrastructure 
people are saying, well, you have to do this. You've got to do this drug. And there was a great, uh, a great uh, piece a couple of days ago uh, talking about this new drug. And they were interviewing a guy who said, oh, this is a breath of fresh air. I'm, I'm giving this drug to all my patients. Oh, who are you? Well, I'm a consultant for the company. Well, okay. Yes. If you're a consultant for your company and you're being paid, and by the way, Biogen has paid the Alzheimer's Association. And the Alzheimer's Association in turn says, oh, we think it's a good drug. They've paid other foundations. You know, this is just an unethical approach, unfortunately. And so it's going to take some time to break through that infrastructure that has been created by billions of dollars. Well, the, the good news, Dale, is that you've really done the work and you've also written a number of books that I think for people listening, lay out the protocols and what to think about, what to test, how to work with your doctor, including the end of Alzheimer's, end of Alzheimer's program. And this new book, I, I sort of want to dip into a little bit, The First Survivors of Alzheimer's, How Patients Recovered Life and Hope in Their Own Words, because, you know, we really, you know, we hear cancer survivors, but we never hear of Alzheimer's survivors. Right. So tell us about some of the stories that uh, you found striking. And what are the takeaways that, that you had from some of these patients? Yeah, you know, this book was really a labor of love because it was so great when I started hearing these stories from the people and how it affects their families. Uh, and for example, uh, uh, Julie, who talked about when she first told her son her diagnosis, she had been to a neurologist and she said, I'm APOE 4-4, so highest risk group. And unfortunately, I have cognitive decline. Can you just at least help me stay where I am? And the doctor looked at her, and said, good luck with that. And what a horrible thing to say to a patient. She told her son, who started crying and said, mom, I don't want you to die. And so she ended up doing these various same sorts of pieces. And she ended up having a, a number of things. She had insulin resistance. Um, she, had, uh, she had inflammation initially. Um, she's done so much better. Interestingly, she then had a little bit of a backslide. And it turned out she ended up having Babesia. She had had a tick uh -huh. bite and had gotten rid of the Lyme, but didn't realize that she had a co-infection. Now it turns out she's also got some mycotoxicity. So that's being dealt with. And with each of these things, you know, she's getting better and better. She's gone from 35th percentile on her cognitive scoring to 98th percentile. Wow. So she's, Almost know, normal. Almost normal. Starch. Yeah. So, you know, high, very, very high normal. So she's doing great. And in fact, she wrote a substantial part of the, the second book, The End of Alzheimer's Program, based on what is she has been doing for her own uh, lifestyle and diet and things like that. So she's one of the seven stories. We have seven wonderful stories. We have Frank, a guy who moved to Mexico because he knew he wouldn't have enough money as he got demented. And uh, wow. in fact, his, his doctor said, oh, you got mild cognitive impairment. And he said, there's nothing mild about this. It's ruining my life. Uh, he's done very, very well. Uh, and we have Sally, who actually went on a drug trial. She had a positive amyloid PET scan. She yeah. was APOE4 positive. She went on a drug trial, and as we've seen with a number of other patients, when she would get the drug, she would get much worse for a couple of weeks and then slowly improve slightly and then get almost back to where she was and then get the next injection a month later. Because remember, this stuff is antimicrobial. So if you have yeah. an ongoing insult, getting rid of it is the last thing you want to do. Right. And so she would get worse. Now, fortunately for her, after her sixth injection, she said, this is making me worse, not better. She quit. Wow. She then wow. went on the protocol, and she's now got a perfect MOCA score of 30. She's done great. 30. Completely yeah, 30 normal. 30. And what, what was it before? She started at 24. So she had significant MCI. Yeah. And again, you don't start going down on your MOCA until you're fairly far along in the disease. Yeah. And she already had the positive amyloid scan. Um, she already had well into MCI, the third of the four stages. Uh, and so, and she's done you know, very, very well. Um, and, and now five years into this um, is still scoring 30 and doing really, really well. Um, she had gotten to the point where she would forget to pick up her granddaughters at school. And she writes about this. And then when she found out, my God, I didn't pick them up. Um, she would be just horrified. Oh, my God, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose my granddaughters because of my cognitive yeah. problems. Um, and so she ended up having a tremendous amount of mycotoxicity, uh, actually had to get away from the source of that. Uh, and go into a detox program, uh, and she's done very, very well. Uh, so we That's have story after story after story of these people and how it affected their families and how much better they've done by doing the right things. This is an extraordinary, deal, And I think that uh, people need to take home that, one, that if you even start to have symptoms, there's something you can do. 
Yes. But more importantly, there's a lot of people who are at risk. So we say there's 14 million people who have are going to have Alzheimer's in a few years. How many people actually have pre-Alzheimer's or are headed that direction? Because it's it's tens and tens of millions, right? And this program, yes. this approach, is not just for when you get it. It's actually a, an approach that you should do decades before you actually get any symptoms if you're at risk, right? Yeah, we recommend that everyone who's 45 years of age or older get a cognoscopy, just like we know when you turn 50, you get a colonoscopy. When you hit 45, please get a cognoscopy. That's a set of blood tests that we've been talking about. It's an online cognitive assessment, very simple, it takes about 30 minutes. Um, and then if you have symptoms already, or if you're scoring poorly on the tests, it includes an MRI with volumetrics. That's it. It's simple to do. I have to say it's much more pleasant than a colonoscopy. Um, get that checked out and then get on appropriate prevention because as you indicated, the numbers are staggering. So if you look across the spectrum and there's a beautiful paper by Professor Christine Yaffe from UC San Francisco who showed that if you just follow serial autopsies, this is now the third leading cause of death. So about 15 wow. percent of people, so about 45 million Americans will die from Alzheimer's disease if we don't do something, if we don't have active prevention and early reversal, we will end up with about 15% of the population dying from this. As you indicated, already about 6 million diagnosed, um, heading for 14 million, but then over 10 million that are on their way to get diagnosed. So we'll end up with you know, all people from zero to, to the oldest ages, about 45 million of the currently living Americans will die from Alzheimer's if we don't get on appropriate prevention and treatment. And what's striking, Dale, is that in the studies on brain imaging, uh, you can see the changes that Alzheimer's is wreaking on people's brains yes. decades before, 20, 30 years before they ever get any symptoms. So Absolutely. That's really impressive. And it, and it tells me that it's really important for people to understand if you have any Alzheimer's in your family, if there's any risk factors, that we need to fix those. And I mean, obviously, all these things people should fix anyway, from diet, exercise, stress, and taking care of their brain. Yeah. But how do you live a brain-healthy lifestyle from the get-go? And that's really important because if you if you let these things slide, it's harder and harder to deal with them. And, and you know, what's even amazing is that even after you, you've gotten the symptoms, which is 20 or 30 years after you first start to get the process going on in your brain, you can start to stop and reverse it, which is what your work is showing. And that that's, that's actually helpful. But I, I encourage people to think about how do they get a cognoscopy earlier in their life, right? 45, 50, whatever, 60, just get these things fixed. And this is what I do in functional medicine, but do you do? And it's really, really so, so powerful. Um, tell us, tell us about um, the way in which you think that the, the current approach is so flawed, because I think, you know, we're, we're, we're spending billions and billions of dollars on hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials for Alzheimer's and most of them have failed. Yeah. So, um, you know, what, what, what is the sort of breakthrough moment for this approach? Because it seems like it's not getting the airtime it needs. It's not getting the scientific attention it needs. There's a lot of, you know, sort of pushback against it. How do we, how do we break through that? Yeah, it's a great point. And, and the problem has been that there's a fundamental flaw in the thinking. Everybody is saying, okay, we don't understand what Alzheimer's is but we're gonna to try to treat it. So I think a lot more needed to be put into what is this thing? You know, it's it's not a virus. It's not like with SARS-CoV-2, with COVID-19, we know what it is. It's a viral illness. We have the you know, variants, we have sequence. We know how to deal with that sort of stuff. People develop vaccines, they develop antivirals, they develop improved immune systems, all that. With Alzheimer's, the problem has been people haven't understood what it is. So they'll say, oh, it's, you know, mentioned type 3 diabetes, and yeah, that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing, right? They'll say, oh, it's all about herpes, or oh, it's all about amyloid, tau, prions, APP changes, I mean, all of these on and on and on. And so if you look at what it actually is and then go after that, it is a network insufficiency. So you're fixing a network. And so I do think that when people start realizing you can't get away with a single prescription, and sure, hallelujah, if there's a prescription one day that does all the different things we need, great. But there's no evidence so far that that is the right way to go. So I think that it's simply going to be continuing to publish these studies. And we're now just getting ready to start a larger randomized controlled trial. 
uh, that'll begin in January, February of next year, depending on when the IRB approves it. Uh, so in that case, we're now also looking to see what needs to be added. So one of the things we've now added is cone beams, because we're finding that some people have oral pathology that is not picked up by standard approaches, standard x-rays, and just looking at the oral microbiome. So we're seeing what needs to be looked at further to, to get the best outcomes from these people. And I do think that when it is standard, when people realize they can get much better treatment by going to places that do this, as opposed to simply these centers uh, that write prescriptions, I think that's when things are going to start to change. So what is the, the next step uh, in your work, you know, what are you, what do you, where do you see the next step of pushing this forward? You, you talked about the study that's going to be published. You're, you've got a study of hundreds of cases in the community, yeah. not that you've treated in a study, but they've been collected that show improvements. What is, what is the next step in your work? Yeah, great point. So three pieces to this. Number one, to now look at people who are in the later stages. Can we do something about the people who come in with MOCA scores of zero, one, two? We've seen people who get, who get better, although they typically don't get all the way better. So they'll improve. They'll start to dress themselves again. They'll start to do this. So that's, we do need to have something for the later stages, although I hope we will rarely see those later stages. You know, this is what happened way back in the days when I was in medical school. There were the, the old timers had seen late stage neurosyphilis. The new yeah. guys would not see late Never stage neurosyphilis because you treat it early. And so we want to get to the same point where you don't ever see a late stage Alzheimer's patient. But until then, we need to address that. Second piece is we need to continue to, to improve the overall approach. And this is why we got the randomized controlled trial uh, starting up. And then the third piece is we need to now adapt this to the neurochemistry of each neurodegenerative disease. Each one it affects a different subsystem of the nervous system. And we need to be able to adapt the neurochemistry for each of those. So we're actually starting with macular degeneration. We have the first few patients already um, who have wow. early macular degeneration. They, they have a different chemistry. And so, in, in fact, interestingly, ApoE4 protects you against macular degeneration. And ApoE2 is the one which protects you from Alzheimer's but increases your risk for macular degeneration. So oh it's boy. a slightly different strategy. You have to go after this. I but am it does, Okay, well, so make sure that, you know, I'm sure you're on top of your, you know, doing the right <laughs> things, um, you know, you're, and you're not a smoker and you're not drinking alcohol, all these things that will predispose you to macular degeneration. So that's, I think that's the third piece of this. We want to be able to do this to make it so that neurodegenerative diseases are things of the past. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. It supports your muscle strength and function, really important for muscle health. It supports your brain health, your mood, cognitive function, neurotransmitter like serotonin, dopamine, cognitive function in terms of neuroprotection against things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It also helps your